Hi, everyone. I'm Odin. Uh, I think most of you know me. I've, I see a lot of familiar faces. And uh, you're probably asking yourself why I grew a little more beard. And the reason is I've, I've been doing more kernel development. And it, <laughs> it kind of comes with the territory, right? But I mean, I, I do have to warn you guys a little because, I mean, I, this is the end of the conference. I've seen a bunch of other people's talks. And I don't know if they study design or something, but there's just like all these beautiful slides. And so I, I have one beautiful slide. And the rest of my slides look like this. But you know, I, I hope the content is, it, you know, makes up for it. Because you know, this is something I'm, I'm pretty passionate about. Uh, I, I do a lot of consulting work and come into companies. And you know, this topic is usually the first thing I look at when I look at their code base, right? What are the interrupts? What priority are they running at? And what are they sharing? Right? And, you know, and is that synchronized correctly? And the answer is always no. The question is in how many places? <laughs> um, and you know, this, these, these are, a lot of these people are using more C or C plus, or maybe you'd say C minus, uh, uh, you know, something like this. And they seem to be having a very hard time with you know, this, this area of, of, of programming. And so, you know, I, I come to conferences, I talk to people on the standards committee, and I say, hey, you know, could we maybe, like, throw them a bone? Could we figure out something to make their lives less hard? And the answers I get are either you don't actually have a problem, or you have an unsolvable problem. <laughs> and I'd like to find some middle ground there. <laughs> So you know this this talk is is not necessarily finding that middle ground. It's more you know let's define the problem. Let's explain what it is that's hard about interrupt service teams and why we can't just throw them out. Because usually if something's hard, you throw it out for something easier, right? I mean, but that doesn't. I mean, you know, you can't always do that. Uh, you know, sometimes you need the hard things. There's there's a reason why they're there. And so yeah, this this. Uh, we're going to look. We're going to look at sort of you know what interrupt service routines are on a very low level, um, because you kind of have to reason up from from down below to really understand why things break and you know why things are unimplementable. Um, if you start at the top, then then somewhere you're just you know building on a bunch of abstractions, which is another word for a lie, um, and and. Uh, we want to, you know, we want to, we want to look at sort of the, the, the truth, the, you know, the, the lower, the lower, you know, the, the first principles, if you will, if you want to borrow sort of a concept from from physics, and uh, and I hope that you know by by kind of, I mean, you know, conferences are mostly a self help group anyway, right? You you go to a conference, talk to other addicts, and talk about the problems that you have with your addiction, right? And <laughs> So, you know, I, I'm going to talk about my problems, and 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 I hope that uh, um, we will, uh, you know, find some solutions because I really want to solve this. I mean, I think this is this is a lot of the reason why in in embedded we can't have nice things. Um, I, I, I overheard in the in the uh, SG14 working group uh, day before yesterday some uh, we'll be nice to him and say unnamed GPU developer uh, said, you know, I've. My understanding, my gut feeling has always been embedded is a synonym for crap. <laughs> and that hurt because it was kind of close to home, right? Like a lot of our, a lot of our code doesn't encapsulate things very well. Right? We, you know, we, we, uh, um, <laughs> we have a problem of code reuse, right? I mean, if, if, if you went into a, a somebody writing server code or something and say, oh, yeah, we write all our own code. We don't use the STL. We don't use any kind of libraries. And oh, and we, you know, we, we do our own relaxed atomics. And, and you go, well, this is probably a pile of bugs. And, but if you look at the parallel, like on, on microcontrollers, we do just that, right? And, and you know, usually it's electronic engineers, too. So they even are trained to do it. So. 
Yeah, so, so, so sort of a roadmap of what's coming at you. We're, we're going to do you know, low-level CPU stuff. We're going to do uh, um, naive implementation of, a pro, of you know, a, uh, an event-based program written entirely in software. We're going to fail at it. And then we're going to look at the problem, like why did we fail? And we're going to look at the hardware solution, which is interrupt service routines. And then we're going to look at uh, the problems with the hardware solution, because, you know, that's our life, right? And then we're going to look at software solutions for the hardware solution for, you know, right? Uh, so going sort of down very, very low level, when, when highly purified silicon and uh, phosphorus gas love each other very much, uh, <laughs> no, we're not going to go that far down. But, uh, so this is sort of what marketing thinks a processor is. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, this is, again, a, a lie, right? I mean, they're, 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 at some level we have transistors which are hard to reason about, so we put them together into gates which are a lot easier to reason about, and then, you know, we build buses which are just a bunch of wires between a bunch of gates, and of RAM, which is basically a bunch of gates connected in a very uniform manner with wires connecting. I mean, you can think of it sort of like a, you know, that, that washing machine dial where you go, okay, this bus is connected to click, 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 that piece of RAM. And on the other end, we have the processor core. And, and well, this bus is connected to click, 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 click. Okay, that assembler instruction, right? So, you know, we, we, we have sort of basic building blocks, you know, machine machine code, which we, you know, decorate with mnemonics to make it assembler. If you think about sort of a very uh, primitive, you know, plus operation, well, I have, you know, one thing going in from one side. Yes, I found the unicorn pen in PowerPoint. Um, one thing going in from the other angle. And then we have, you know, the result goes somewhere. And, you know, yes, we can make the result go back into one of them, right? But I mean, if, if this, you know, thing A, thing B plus result goes somewhere, I need three addresses of things. If these were actual addresses in a 32-bit system, then I'd need a lot of bits to express that operation, right? But, you know, uh, on, on, you know, Cortex microcontrollers, which are at least half the market by now, come on, risk five. Anyway. Um, <laughs> There are 16-bit instructions, right? So if I have a 16-bit instruction, then you know how, how how do I make that work? Well, you know the, the first uh, bits of the instruction are which instruction is it, right? That's the washing machine dial, right? Okay, bus goes into which which hardwired operation, and then I have my uh, let's skip over this one. Then I have whether or not it's add or subtract. Why we couldn't just put this bit there and then make an add and a subtract? You know, hardware devs have a weird sense of humor. Um, then we have, you know, output, one of the inputs. The other input uh, is multiplexed by this flag. Is this an actual address of some input, or is this just a three-bit number, right? So if you're in a for loop and you're adding one or two or whatever, then that's just going to be one of the assembler instruction. I don't need to actually, have, you know, take that one from somewhere. I can just put it in directly. But you notice that these addresses are only three bits. Right? What they're actually addressing are the uh, work registers in the core, right? And so some instructions will be able to address from R0 to R7. You know, three bits will only get you that far. And then some instructions will have a four bit address. So we, you know, we can't actually work directly on RAM, which is why we need, you know, loads and stores. And this is not true for all processors. Right? You know, the, the, first, the first microcontroller I worked on could address RAM directly um, because it was an 8-bit microcontroller with 256 bytes of RAM. And it had 14-bit instructions for some reason, um, which meant that you couldn't implement C++ on it because you didn't have contiguous memory. In, in Flash, you had, uh, you know, 14 bits and then a couple that weren't wired to anything and then another 14 bits, so you couldn't put text in there. Yeah. Um, those aren't that popular anymore, but uh, most, most sort of current processors follow this model somewhat, where you have, you know, work registers in the processor. You can take RAM, put it in work registers, work on those work registers, put it back in RAM. And this allows you to make your processor 
run faster than RAM because not all operations actually have to touch RAM. So typically it'll run you know, twice as fast or four times as fast as the actual RAM, which is great because you know, RAM is most of the gates on the chip. And so you can make it faster without making it too much more expensive and marketing loves that, right? Like you can you can say, oh, we're at 120 megahertz processor. And it's like, yeah, but the RAM isn't. <laughs> but I mean, the, the takeaway here, you know, the, the relevance to um, interrupt service routines here is the processor has state that's not, you know, addressed, addressable, right? So if we want to switch context into something else, then we need to put that state somewhere. We'll, we'll get back to that. The other takeaway here is, uh, you know, where we are in the program, like, you know, if you're thinking debugger, where that little debugger arrow is, that's actually very primitive. It's just a physical register that's the program counter. And every clock cycle, this thing gets automatically incremented, and then that address gets fetched. And, you know, washing machine dial goes into the next operation. And some of your operations can actually write directly to the program counter. So if you want to branch somewhere, well, what's the address you want to branch to? Just write it in there and you're there, right? I mean, have fun getting back if you didn't push where you were before. And so, you know, we get to the, to the uh, you know, the whole inner workings of a function call and building up a stack frame and all that kind of stuff. And I mean, who here would feel comfortable like implementing a stack frame and assembler here on the stage? Nobody. You? Bet your salary it's going to be right? Would you bet your salary it's going to be right? No. Yeah, OK. So I mean, the, the interesting thing here is uh, your employer is probably betting more money that your code's right, for one. Um, the, back in the day, when I used to program an assembler, you could blow stack frames, right? You actually had to do this. But anymore, we've encapsulated it correctly, so it's no longer a problem. I mean, all of you couldn't do it, at least without researching it first. And that's OK. Your code still works, right? So if we, can, if we can come up with a solution which is always correct and doesn't cost us very much, because you know, stack frames in this whole model, it does cost us a bit, right? Like if you know a lot more about your program, you can do weird shit. Uh, I mean, I, I've I've uh, implemented a, well, something similar to the new static exceptions where I discriminated the result based on the return address. So if there was no error, I would return to one further than I was called from, and then put the error handler directly after the function call. Now, you, I wouldn't suggest doing that on anything with branch prediction, because you're completely going to blow that, right? But, but on a microcontroller, like you can beat stack in efficiency. But that doesn't matter, because having it encapsulated means you have more time to work on other things. And efficiency is basically efficiency with some certain set of time that is never infinite. Right? So, so I would like to be able to abstract uh, and encapsulate sort of interrupt service routines and, and, and sort of their influence on the program in the same way that we did with stack frames so that it's not something we have to teach people. Because we can't teach everybody about all the dangers. I mean, I'm sure people have tried. I know Reiner Grimm has been running around all over Germany teaching people how to write C++. I still go into companies and they don't know how to do it. I don't know what you're doing, man. No, <laughs> no we don't have the resources. We can't clone him a bunch of times, right? <clears throat> so yeah, it would be nice to abstract it away. So let's look at how hard that is. So I had a very similar phone, a similar phone than this phone from a similar company because I don't want to get sued. Um, <laughs> And this similar phone had, had some weird functionality, right? Weird things would happen if you didn't use it the exact way that they did during testing, right? And, and we can actually look at how we could maybe implement something like this, right? It's got a bunch of buttons on it. It's got a screen. If you want to look through your contacts, you start pushing buttons. Maybe push, I don't know, one, because it could be A, B, or C, it's the, you know, start of the first name. and then. You, I don't know, next one's eight or something, and then it'll look for all combinations of either A, B, or C, and then either T, U, or V, right? And then keep on going, right? So you know, modeled in software, something like, you know, check for input. That's going to give us back 
whether or not some key was pressed and which one. Then we're going to refine our selection of possible names that it could be. And then we're going to update the screen. Okay. Um, so if we look at this process sort of very, very low level, when I push a button, you know, here over time, I push the button and the voltage goes up. And then when I stop pushing it, it goes back down. If we're, if we're programming this on the, you know, the very low level, I'm going to check, hey, is that up? At this point in time, no, it's not. Then I'm going to circle around the loop again and I'm going to check, hey, is it up? No, it's not. Then I'm going to circle around and go, oh, yeah, somebody's pressing it now, right? And then I'm going to do some work, right? And then I'm going to go through the loop again because I'm done rendering my, you know, letters and sending them to the screen and now I'm checking again. Okay, well, it's not a new press, it's still up, right? So, okay, so I need a little more refined logic to say, okay, after it goes up, it has to go down again before it can go up again, right? So I want a rising edge, if you will. And then, yeah, you know, it'll go down and then and, and we're all good, right? But, but what if I had more work to do? I mean, more things are running on this processor, right? Yeah, you know, that, that dot, dot, dot had things in it in the code, right? Maybe I'm, I don't know, talking over the deck uh, network, right? Or maybe I'm, uh, I don't know, playing some sound. So if I check, and then I do work, and then I check again, life sucks, right? <laughs> and this is something that this phone actually did, right? Like if you were listening to the answering machine, you couldn't push buttons. And I mean, you know, you find similar things like this all over the place. Uh, um, I, I actually had a, a bank machine that I had fun crashing until they took my card and told me it wasn't funny. Um, <clears throat> this was I, apparently written in Java and, and only had like so and so much uh, you know, buffer for keys, right? And you could, you could put money on your phone on this bank machine. And so if you, you know, you know, prepaid card, right? Put in my account and then type in my phone number, hit OK, type in my phone number again, even though that, I mean, it was Java, so the screen took a while to show me that, like, right? But you could just type away and it would all go into the buffer. And if you went fast enough, it would crash, right? And then, you know, because I'm, I'm a nerd, right? So I noticed, okay, they've fixed this, right? They put a, like a limit on the length of the buffer. But if you, if you put in 16 key presses, or sorry, 15 key presses, and then the cancel button, because apparently the cancel button was some Unicode character that was a two byte character, then you could put like an invalid key at the end of that buffer, right? But, you know, back to microcontroller, like, like, you know, you can, you can miss events because of latency starvation, right? Like, you know, what, you know, something happened, and then we react to it a certain amount of time later because we're doing something else. Latency, right? And you know, this may be latency from reacting to an event, or maybe you know, I, I received a byte and latency before I send the answer back, you know, line timed out, whatever. Right? So, so how do we fix this problem of having something to do that takes longer than the latency that we can tolerate? Well, we could, we could use threads. Right? Let's, let's look at sort of how that works. Right? So we have some thread zero with a stack frame. These little blue boxes are stack frames. It's a stack frame main, all of its local variables, blah, blah, blah. Maybe main calls something, function A, function A gets put, you know, address, address is going up or down depending on your chip, right, is the, the dimension here, right? So, so off the end of the stack, we'll put the next stack frame. Off the end of that stack, we'll put the next stack frame. This is sort of this, the, you know, the single threaded version. But if we want to switch between different threads, each one of those is going to need its own stack, right? And each stack needs to grow and shrink so we can't have two share, right? Because if we, you know, put the other thread just at the end of that stack, then it would sleep for something and then we'd come back and then we'd have, you know, that, that function couldn't call another function again because it doesn't have the stack space, right? So the other thread has its own stack. And then we remember from, from the beginning, each each thread needs its own copy of all of the, the core's state, right? Because if we switch from one to the other, then you know, maybe one had something in its work register that it wants to keep working on. Well, those need to get cached away somewhere, and we switch to, to the other. Uh, um, 
thread. So each thread needs a copy of all of the CPU state. And when we switch, we, you know, again, unicorn pen, because that makes everything great. Um, so we switch the CPU registers into, you know, one thread, cache them away, load them from the other thread, and we can call things on that thread and, uh, you know, switch back and forth, you know, calling things here, there, whatever, right? So we're thinking in terms of sort of hard real time here, because this is, I mean, you know, we, we have a constraint for this button push. And depending on who you ask, I think uh, Volta von Oyen did a very good description of sort of what hard, you know, how to categories, how to categorize different systems and whether they're hard real time or not. If you have, you know, a server algorithm or something, then its utility will get better the faster it goes in some amortized way, right? If you have a reactive system like your phone screen or something, you have something painfully slow over on the left-hand side, right? And as we go through the, what I call like the Java section, it gets a little faster and a little faster, right? And then once you get into like the, you know, guy that's mostly made of hair and programs in Haskell section, at some point it gets faster to where you don't really, it, it doesn't give you any new utility, right? I mean, at the point where you're faster than the frame rate of the screen, then no one can notice, right? And then you have hard real time where either it's crap or it's good enough, right? Airbag works, airbag doesn't work, right? I mean, most things are a little less sexy than an airbag. Uh, you know, protocol times out, I need to reconnect all the time or not, right? Uh, so, you know, for, for our button press, we're probably more in this reactive system thing because you can push the button again. But, you know, if this were an auto industrial automation system or something, you'd probably be here because it would just be so expensive to fix it every time something breaks or something gets out of sync or whatever. It, it just has to guarantee that it's meeting that goal, right? But there's actually other timing things that are interesting to us. We don't just have latency. You know, if I'm on my phone and I'm, you know, playing some audio or recording some audio, as it were, right? I have some uh, interval at which I want to uh, run my uh, analog digital converter and sample the line, right? And I don't care if these arrows shift back and forth a little bit, as long as they all do, right? It's kind of a relative latency to each other. Because, I mean, if we have something like this, because we're doing a bunch of work in between, then that audio quality is going to be terrible, right? And this is also a problem that this phone had. When I was scrolling on the screen and talking on speakerphone, I would sound like some alien attack to the person on the other end of the line, right? Uh, and this is known as jitter, right? You know, jitter and latency are somewhat different. Um, with, you know, with, with changing signals, uh, some shift in the time domain of when you're sampling usually is somewhat equivalent in, in, the, in the degradation of quality of signal to differences in the amplitude domain, right? Either I have a digital analog converter that's not as precise, or I have a sampling interval that's not as precise. Both of them give me some kind of noise that's not actually there. Right? So thinking back to our, you know, our, our, our threading model, can we really solve these problems with threads? I mean, with, with, uh, with latency, maybe. I mean, it depends on what our, our latency is. Um, if our latency is the size, you know, our, our, our max tolerable latency is the size of, you know, several time slices in the scheduler, right? Because the scheduler will let this thread run for a certain amount of time and then it'll switch, and then let that thread run for a certain amount of time and then it'll switch again. Um, you might be able to make it work, right? I mean, the, the times, you can't just make the time slice infinitely small because every time you switch, you have a whole bunch of bookkeeping to do. Right? You have to switch around stack pointers, you have to you know, cache all the local state, you have to do all that kind of stuff. So you know, the, the, the portion of your time that you're using for bookkeeping in the scheduler shouldn't be like 50% of your processor or something. So there is like a hard lower limit on the size of your time slice. 
So you could have a, you know, a, a thread running at the highest priority and say, okay, it will never have more of a latency than the length of a time slice because once the scheduler gets uh, control back from the processor, then it will switch to this thread, right? As long as there are no other high priority threads and as long as there's no priority inversion, which we'll get to later, it's not quite that simple. <laughs> but as far as jitter, I mean, forget about it, right? Like, you know, the, the phase shift of your, of your uh, scheduler, that's, that's not gonna end well, right? I mean, you can't usually, if you're talking audio signals, you can't just say, oh yeah, you know, we'll just be half a sine wave later, <laughs> right? And then a half a sine wave earlier next time because we got the processor back early. So, so we need to find a way to not have to cache all of the, um, all of the processor state, right? Because for, for small tasks, we probably don't need to invalidate it all anyway, right? We also, I mean, it, it would be nice to not have to have multiple stacks because then you have the problem of multiple max stack depths, right? If you don't have virtual addressing, you can't just page in more RAM as the stack grows. So, I mean, who knows the exact max stack depth of their program, right? Again, bet your year's salary on it. No, no one, right? I mean, we're guessing and praying here. I mean, the, the formula that most people use, because it's very, very scientific, is they take whatever they saw as the maximum stack depth they ever observed, and they multiply it by pi, because that's very scientific. Um, but at the end of the day, it's just guess and pray, right? So if we have one stack, we still don't know, but we have more of a sort of average of, of our errors, right? And we can make that stack grow into RAM that doesn't exist, right? I don't think there are any chips that let you do that without some kind of reset or hard fault handler. So at least you have defined behavior when it grows into something. A car doesn't just slam on the gas randomly on the freeway. Well, I guess it was a while ago that Toyota did that, but that was a stack overflow, right? It grew into global variables. And you know, if it had gone off and then rebooted and turned itself back on, that would have killed a lot less people, right? So, you, so if you have defined functionality when something happens, then, then this is an advantage. So what if we were to say, okay, that, that function f, we'll just put that function f randomly somewhere in our code after a certain amount of instructions so that it gets called, it calls something, calls something, returns, 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 and then, oh, we're back to where we started again. Right? And, you know, back in the early 80s, uh, people actually did this. There were, there were actually compilers that would insert, like, a function call every so and so many instruction cycles. Uh, and they'd have to engineer the code so that all the branches were the same length so that they could actually do this. Right? And, I mean, this was a thing, like, you know, a friend of mine wrote his dissertation on this topic. Yeah, you know, it turned out to be a really stupid idea, but, um, I mean, there, there are some areas, you know, in cryptography people still do this because then you can't, uh, you can't learn as much from the algorithm it ran based on how long it took, right? But, but this is becoming sort of a niche thing because you're wasting a whole lot of time doing nothing, for one, and you're wasting a whole lot of flash and you have to, you know, I mean, modern processors don't take the same amount of time for every instruction cycle anyway. Right? So even if you have the same number of steps, it might take a different amount of time. So it would be nice to be able to just inject a function call into another running process at any given point. It runs, I mean, it can't sleep, it can't hold a lock, it can't, you know, it can't switch back because it's on the stack of the other guy. But as long as it runs until it's done, you know, run to completion, if you will, then, uh, we should be able to just randomly inject these things onto the stack of other processes as long as we keep track of what state we mutate. I mean, this is a somewhat different model. Rather than saying, I can take all the processor state, if I'm just a function call, I know that I only touch, I don't know, R3 to R0 and the program counter. So I cache away the program counter, cache away R3 to R0, restore those things, we're all good, right? And then, you know, I can just keep on running. Um, we do get into a problems though if we touch things that we don't know that we touched, right? 
if, if we touch, I don't know, floating point registers. I mean, in, in uh, sort of desktop or cell phone or whatever kernel development, in Linux kernel development, you have what's called signal semantics. And in signal semantics, you're allowed to do some things, and you're not allowed to do other things. And the, you know, the libc, the, if you get like one of the versions of libc that the, the uh, um, kernel developers use, that'll be very, very meticulously documented what each function is allowed to touch and whether it's signal safe and whether it's a reentrant and blah, blah, blah. We don't have that for the standard library, right? We don't have that for any of our infrastructure. So you don't know what it's touching. This is probably one of the more sort of misunderstood things when I, when I uh, um, go into embedded companies in sort of a consulting role is you know, race conditions from things that people thought were atomic, right? Because I mean, you may have guessed it, this sort of function call injection. This is an interrupt service routine. This is, this is how they work, right? I mean, the most, the most primitive uh, interrupts, you basically have uh, you know, some input pin, the interrupt pin, for every rising edge on this interrupt pin. The program, or the, the core, just takes the current program counter, puts it on a stack, and then write some uh, you know, hard-coded address into it, and you have to make your linker put your reaction function at that address, and you just inject this function call wherever you are. Right? And usually you're gonna have to you know, cache away a few work registers, because otherwise you can't do anything. And, and uh, um, yeah, that's, that's actually how the first processor I, I used worked. And, but you know, over the years, they've gotten a bit more sophisticated. You have, uh, rather than one interrupt, because if you have one interrupt, you have to figure out, okay, what triggered this thing? And you have to go through, oh, well, was it that thing? No, was it that thing? No, was it that thing? Yes, but it could have also been something else in the meantime. And yeah, it gets all complicated. You also want different priorities in your interrupts, right? Because I mean, even if somebody's pushing buttons, I still probably want to react to uh, you know, the wireless chip earlier because I have even more stringent hard real-time guarantees on my, my DECT uh, uh, network on my phone. So on modern, on modern uh, chips, we have what's called the nested vector interrupt controller. And if you saw the block diagram in the original processor, it was on there. Like that's part of marketing, how good your NVIC is. Uh, how many instruction cycles does it take to get to interrupt, you know, get to your interrupt service routine from, you know, after event. And if, you know, you, you pay good money to take two or three off of there, right? Um, you have basically, it's, it's just a, an array of pointers in Flash that starts at some known address. And so you have, okay, here's the function pointer for this happened. Here's the function pointer for that thing happened. And you also have, you know, registers that enable, disable them. You have registers that set their priority, all this kind of stuff, right? Um, so if you look at this code, right, we have our interrupt service routine up at the top. We have our main function. Both of them touch this global thing, right? Is this a race condition? Yes. Why? <laughs> Why is a little more interesting? Because remember, I mean, you know, if, if you think of the world as, okay, I'm just incrementing that variable. Well, I have an add function that has one and no, but my add function can't touch RAM directly. It actually has to load RAM into this W, which is just a placeholder for actual in-processor state, right? This is the work register zero or one or whatever the, uh, the uh, um, linker decided to use. So I read this thing, and then I decrement it, and then I write it back out into RAM. And if we have some interrupt service routine in between there, I'm gonna read this thing, have some local state, Interrupt service team doesn't know about that. It's gonna modify it, return, and I'm just gonna flush my local state back into uh, you know, the actual RAM address because I don't know that the interrupt service team ran. Right? And the volatile keyword doesn't help. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that's, if you really, really wanna find bugs in embedded code really quickly, grep for volatile and look for this. Right? I mean, you know, homework everybody, YouTube, Vol uh, not YouTube, GitHub, Volatile, have a look. I'm willing to bet something like 30% or something, just in an astronomically high amount of, of uh, 
uh, variables marked volatile are race conditions, even though somebody tried to make them not race conditions. Right? Uh, which is why even though I work on bare metal and I you know, need this feature all the time, I think we should deprecate it and change how it works. But that's another talk. Um, so how do we fix this? OK. Nobody said atomic. I've got a great crowd. <laughs> no, I mean, you know, the, 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 if, if I was at the uh, talking to standard committee people, it'd be, oh, we have atomic for that, right? Well, I mean, in theory, yeah, that probably maybe should be the right thing to do, but this is what my implementation says. I have no idea why this means I don't have atomics, but this means I don't have atomics. But like, why, why, don't I, why can't I just implement atomics in terms of turning off interrupts? You can. Although, it depends on how you would turn off, uh, atomics, uh, turn off interrupts. Uh, this, is, this is still nuanced. Like, when you turn off interrupts, how long does it take till they're actually off, right? I mean, this register might be the other end of a bus that has bus latency. There might be a DMA that's cycle stealing from that bus, right? I mean, they're, they're, so it's not quite that cut and dried, but still, I mean, I could, and, and a lot of people do do this. They have, you know, the, the most embedded operating systems have, you know, semaphores and atomics and whatnot all implemented in terms of turning off global interrupts because there is, there is an assembler instruction that says, okay, turn interrupts off, right? So you inline assembler, put that instruction in there, are we good? No, because nobody said you couldn't reorder it, right? Okay, put the assembler instruction, mark the, uh, you know, the, the, the assembler uh, scope volatile, are we good? Why not? This is also not very well understood. The, the update to the shared resource, to the atomic thing, it can't escape that, you know, volatile, you know, two volatile assembler blocks, as long as it's also marked volatile, right? You know, volatile loads and stores can't be ordered past other ones. But other stuff can be reordered into this block. So your interrupts could be off for a lot longer than you think, right? Uh, it doesn't happen very often because there isn't really a reason to. But sometimes there is. If you're, if you're touching some address, it's actually a lot more efficient for the processor to load from address that's next to another address that I already had, right? Because address is 32-bit. If you have 16-bit instruction set, it takes a couple of cycles to actually load a full address. But you also have load with offset. So if the, if the optimizer can reorder things such that like addresses are close to each other, then it will load a lot more, a, a lot less address information, right? So, I mean, you can actually make this happen on Godbolt. Um, and even if you couldn't, it's allowed to happen, so it will happen at some point in the future, right? Like the, the, the clan guys don't sleep. Um, so, so if interrupts are off for a lot longer than you expected, is that bad? Like, what's that called? Starvation, right? You get, you get, you know, something needs to run within a certain amount of time, and something else is running, stopping that thing from running. So it starves it, right? And obviously, you know, the throwaway line, this phone will still have those problems. Um, <laughs> if you pushed a button often enough, you could make the answering machine crash, right? Because something needed to run and you took up all of its time, right? Um, so how do I prove lack of starvation in my program? Right? Like, I have some internet service gene that has to run every so often. How do I make sure that it can? Can't test it, because you're never going to get all the combinations, right? Full code review of optimized assembler? So I'd do it, but you'd have to redo it every time you compiled, because it's going to be different optimized assembler, right? So we, we don't, we just guess and pray again. Doesn't really sound like we solved the problem, does it? <laughs> and the, I mean, here's the thing, it's probably not gonna bite you. Like, it doesn't bite you that often because, you know, it's one in many chance and 
But when it does, you're not happy, right? Like, I mean, there's some filter on who goes into the embedded domain, and it has to do with love of pain or something. You know, I mean, this, 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 is, this is not fun. I mean, this is why when you go to, you know, your typical embedded uh, conference, you have to fight your way through people selling you debug tools, right? But that's, that's more of an indication of a problem, in my opinion, than it is a solution. Right? Because you can't, you can't have a debug tool that's good enough to actually always find these things. Right? So, so we actually need to find those problems at compile time or make them never be able to occur. So like I said, you know, disabling interrupts is a full code review. What if I know that only one thing is ever touching this variable, right? Uh, you know, this variable is touched only by the, you know, uh, I don't know, the terminal thread and the, the, the I received a byte interrupt service routine. They share it. Can I just turn off the, uh, you know, I received a byte interrupt service routine? Maybe, but what if the I received, you know, what, what if I turn that off and something else interrupts me while it's off? Suddenly I have priority inversion, right? I have the I received a byte thing, high priority because we don't want to overflow the buffer. And then, you know, low priority thread, main thread, whatever, turn that off, but only that. Something much lower level interrupts that, takes forever. We starved it again, right? So, so this won't work. But what you can do, I mean, I've, Getting, getting past you know, some of the, some of the uh, life, life is terrible thing and getting to actually some advice in this talk. Um, if you turn off that interrupt and all the lower priority interrupts, so you turn them off in categories, then you can actually make this work without the possibility of priority inversion. It, uh, I mean, you know, de facto, you raise the level of um, you know, raise the priority of interrupts that are allowed to run to the priority of that interrupt. So everything at that priority or lower can't run, and everything at that priority and higher still can, right? So the, the amount of code that you need to review when you want to prove that interrupt priority X, Y, Z won't starve is all the priorities of the higher priority interrupts and all the priorities of the same priority interrupts, but not the lower ones. And this is, you know, this is, this is uh, a huge step forward because high priority interrupts usually don't do much, right? So, and usually they care about the highest few, right? Suddenly you don't have to review all of your business logic. As long as you are completely sure that no one in the entire program is just turning off all the interrupts, right? Oh, I, uh, yeah. If you lock an interrupt service team, it's a deadlock. I should have put that somewhere else in the talk, sorry. Um, so, so if we have, you know, things running at different priorities preempting each other, and we're blocking up to the level of the highest priority that uses this resource, and if we are the highest priority, we won't even have to lock because who's going to interrupt us, right? Then we can start to make systems that we can reason about. Right? And in order to not block up to higher priorities as often, it's actually pretty easy to implement an atomic queue on a lot of these processors. Right? They have a good compare and swap. Usually the compare and swap is actually like a super CAS because you get a swap fail even if you have the same value in again but you were interrupted. Right? It's, it's, I mean, it's very primitively implemented just basically, did an interrupt service gene interrupt me, yes or no? If yes, then CAS failed. Right? So, so you don't have the ABA problem. Um, so if we lock around shared resources by priority, then we can actually take a lot of steps in the direction of solving this. The problem is that's not super easy to write, and it's definitely not so easy to maintain. Because if I want to take the priority of some, uh, of some thread and change it, well, that's pretty involved, right? I have to change all the places where it shared stuff and things block up to, and maybe now I'm no longer the highest priority, so I need to start blocking around things I didn't used to need to block around, and you're gonna forget those, right? 
So it's, it's not super practical. I mean, some people actually do use this paradigm, but it's built on programmer discipline. And programmer discipline is definitely a lie, right? I mean, this is like, we're gonna find unicorns before we find unwavering programmer discipline. So I met this guy at our conference. Uh, oh yeah, I, I run the EMBO conference for microcontroller nerds in Germany. Come, it's great. Uh, I, met, I met this guy named Emil at our conference. And Emil's a genius. Um, Emil told me that he learned how to metaprogrammer for, from reading my metaprogramming stuff. And that makes him a genius because I didn't document that at all. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> um, and Emil, he, he, he works at some Swedish university like way in the north and he's really productive during the winter because it's dark outside and under a bunch of snow. And I actually said that at a, a, another talk and he said, no, I'm not under a bunch of snow because there's this giant steel mill that puts out enough heat to melt all the snow in our town. But, um, <laughs> So he's not under snow, but he's still like in the dark and, and, and works on things all winter. And he had a drone for a research project. And very shortly after the beginning of the project, the drone just crashed, right? It was a very expensive drone. So he called the, or I guess he emailed the, the manufacturer and said, what's up? Why did my drone just die? And he said, well, send us a, a, you know, a log. He sent him a log and they wrote him back, well, it crashed. Like, yeah, it cra well, no, it crashed and then it crashed. And <laughs> <clears throat> so Emil built a scheduler that couldn't crash, right? Like it couldn't deadlock, it, it couldn't starve, at least, you know, only above priority X can it starve. And it was basically along this paradigm, but um, he was the first user of the quasi metric programming library, which meant we broke his code like 15 times or something during development. It was like, I feel this would be great, but it's gonna break email. Oh, I'll write him a patch and just send him a PR. So uh, yeah, but you know, what, 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 this, what this does, you, you list all of your shared resources and all of your threads and which threads can touch which resources and let the metaprogramming figure out the locking, right? Shared resources, you can't touch them directly. You can just pass a lambda in, and it will lock, and then pass a, a reference to the shared resource into your lambda, and then when you're done, it'll unlock again, right? So you, you can't screw this up, right? It's, it's pretty, pretty statically checked, bulletproof interface, and then you can just change the priorities and let the mega programming figure it out. And you know, this, this kind of thing is the reason why I put so much effort into making metaprogramming more scalable, because the original version only worked with a couple of threads, and now we can have like a thousand, um, which is definitely enough for, for, for a microcontroller, right? So the question is like, what abstractions, what standard library abstractions and whatnot can I use with this thing? Well, not really any, because they're not documented. I mean, most of them will probably work, but I don't like probably, right? Um, Pop quiz, can I use all of the core language keywords with this thing? Function local statics, as in I have a function, and in that function I have a static variable, as of C++11, are guaranteed to be initialized once. The constructor of that thing will run once on first use. How do I implement that as a compiler without just turning off all interrupts. I, I can't really, right? And that constructor could be, you know, long running, right? It's not just a question of, oh, well, get over it. It won't be off for very long. We'll put in memory fences and blah, blah, right? I mean, even if, I mean, even if it were just a pointer swap and we could say, okay, interrupts are gonna be off for a very short period of time. We can promise this, right? But put a memory fence so things don't get reordered into there. You can still break people's expectations. Because on a microcontroller, you usually have multiple buses and multiple banks of RAM. So if I have on one bus, cycle stealing DMA, stealing all my cycles, you know, copying RAM to USB or something, and this, uh, this pointer that I wanna swap out lives in that RAM bank and therefore needs to go over that bus. But 
I have in my architectural planning put all the stuff I need to do while that's happening in this other RAM bank. Suddenly interrupts are off for as long as it takes to copy that block into the USB buffer, which I'm certainly not expecting, right? I mean, if I, you know, if I tried to do this in sort of Amiel's scheduler -y way, it's called correct, C-R-E-C-T, if you want to uh, look at it later. Um, if I want to do that in, in this way, then I, I would block up to interrupt priority X and not all of them. So I'd still have the problem, but only up to the level of priority that this function local static could be uh, accessed at, right? So I'm not really sure how to implement this language feature properly, right? And I'm not even aware of some linter that will allow me to just find these and not use them. I mean, the problem is if you try and use boost library stuff, people love these things, right? I mean, if you, even like stuff that shouldn't, right? You know, two upper, why does two upper have like a bazillion function local statics? Yeah. Yes. Although a different flavor, but yes, yes. Um, and as, as, as a funny anecdote, I, I had an intern that used boost to upper on a microcontroller, and he came to me saying, I, I have this weird linker error that I've never seen before. And I, well, I okay, let's have, have a look. He only had one line in his main function, it was two upper. And the linker error was that the chip was full. <laughs> Because it pulled in locales, which pulled in thread local storage, which pulled in like everything, right? So, I mean, who's to say I don't use a library today, which doesn't fill my chip, and tomorrow they fill my chip because of, you know, undocumented weirdness, right? It's very hard to share code on microcontrollers without other sort of guarantees. And the, the, the freestanding proposal, which I think for marketing purposes should be called the no secret singletons proposal because people hate singletons. Because that's basically what it is, right? Let's get rid of all the singletons like locales and blah, or at least make a version of the standard library that doesn't have them. Um, this is probably documentation enough, right? I mean, if, if we write libraries that don't secretly share things, where all the shared state is part of the public interface, even if it's a template parameter, like with an allocator, right? As long as I can see it, we're all good. Right? So, so, you know, that, I think the future of microcontrollers is, is going to be good. I mean, we have, we had 100 people last year at our conference that are all building infrastructure for this paradigm. Um, it's definitely going to be different, but, I mean, that's okay. We program differently on GPUs. We program differently on, on all sorts of different platforms. Uh, why not on microcontrollers? I mean, yeah, it is a, a, a very large part of the C++ community that uses the subset of C++ biased by, you know, time of invention. This subset's called C. Um, maybe they should, you know, move their way up the chain in the subset because it's not about performance. We can definitely beat them in performance with, you know, metaprogram stuff. Metaprograms trump macros and therefore C++ is better than C. <laughs> Okay, that's, you know, if you want to contact me, here's all my contact stuff. Uh, that's the conference, embo.io. Uh, it's in March. Come, we have beer. And uh, I guess we can open up for questions. <laughs> yeah, Adam. The question was, how much of that problem goes away if you have proper atomics? And the counter question is, what are proper atomics? Uh, atomics in the thread sense, or in the, you know, uh, uh, I mean, if, if you implement atomics in terms of compare and swap operations, which most, you know, the smaller atomics, the, you know, the ones that, are, that fit in the compare and swap size uh, will work. Um, this helps. I mean, this, this mitigates the problem a lot, and we do use, you know, compare and swap atomic things. Not all marker controllers have a CAS, uh, so that doesn't necessarily solve the problem. You can actually fake a CAS if you can prepend something and all into all of your interrupt service handlers, but uh, 
it doesn't say it, do, it doesn't really solve the problem of um, you know long running processes needing to be interrupted. Uh, I mean, you you can't say okay, my main loop is somehow an atomic or whatever, right? So yeah, I mean, it, it, it definitely lowers the amount of shared resources that you need to synchronize in this way. And uh, I the way we program, we don't share much. We, we do message passing through a queue, and the queue is atomic. And so we don't actually have a lot of shared state. Um, but it really depends on what you're doing, whether that's viable. Any other questions? Yeah. Where do coroutines fit into this model? Um, coroutines are awesome in this model, at least in theory, because uh, you know if if you are if you are any preemptive run to completion kernel, you have to run to completion. You can't sleep, right? And so you either have to model your your process that actually needs to wait for things while making forward progress as a state machine with several steps in every time, right? Uh, or you put syntactic sugar on top of that, which is a coroutine, right? It's basically the same thing happening under the hood, but uh, in the coroutine case, it's a lot easier to read and reason about because you're, you know, co-await, co-yield in the middle there is definitely better than, oh, well, there's this state uh, uh, transition action, which is this lambda, and then it goes, this next lambda is basically just after that happens, but when this event comes and whatever, it's a lot, lot, lot harder to reason about. It's a little unfortunate with coroutines that um, we've, I guess you could say we've run into a little problems with the architecture of the language itself because in all other cases, local variables in a function, you know, the, the, the stack frame, its size is not over, and layout are not observable. Right? I can't just say, well, that stack frame, I'm going to do like pointer diff of this local variable. That no, you can't do that. Right? So the optimizer is allowed to shrink or even grow those things. I mean, a lot of times they'll be able to like reorder things around. Okay, this thing that's going into a register that's never going to exist. These two things, they're not, they're not there at the same time. So I can make it be the one until I get reach this point in the program, and then it's the other after reordering and those kinds of tricks. But if you look at sort of uh, um, vectorization. It could actually grow, right? I could actually have more state in my stack frame than in debug mode. And so, as soon as you want to put that in a persistent variable, right? Because you know, if the coroutine yields, well, its local state can't be on the stack anymore. The next person running something is going to write overwrite it. So as soon as that has to go into some named variable, named variables size and layout are observable compile time. So suddenly you can't optimize it anymore. So how do you get around that problem? And I guess there are there are uh, there are a bunch of different proposals on sort of how to how to mitigate this. But what got into the coroutines TS is uh, you pretend to allocate it on the heap, and in the vast majority of cases, rely on the optimizer to take it back off the heap, right? Because things of which is size we don't know go on the heap, right? Which means you're going to run into problems if you do weird things to the operator new, right? Because this thing is only fake going on the heap most of the time, even in debug mode. So yeah, that, that will be interesting figuring out how to mitigate that. I don't know if that's the solved problem yet, but coroutines in general are awesome for this, for this uh, paradigm, certainly. I think we have time for one more question if there's, ah, Ansel. Yeah. Well, the question was, you know, can't can't we can't we uh, build Clang tooling uh, to find function local statics so that we know we're not using them? Um, you can also just look in the linker output, uh, which is probably going to be more reliable because uh, all the ones that got optimized away you don't really care about, right? So you have less false positives if you look in the linker output. But it's still frustrating if you look in the linker output and you see a bunch of stuff in the boost namespace and go. Damn it! I shouldn't have upgraded Boost, right? If you're only looking at the, the cases that are not optimized, the lazy next 
pattern compiled to my, my not. Yeah, what's optimized away will change from compile to compile. Yeah. Uh, well, you can make like a CI hook or something to, to check this and, you know, gripe about the commit if you, yeah. I mean, I think, uh, like the, the state of the art in this domain is a pile of hacks, and that's probably not the most egregious hack. Uh, um, but I mean, I agree that it would be nice if we could actually solve this in a very you know elegant way. Um, you had a question? Yeah, you know, you, you yeah. When I do that, it's basically almost all, like at this flying end, GCC has a specific function it calls to acquire that lock. I think GCC is called like CX, CXA underscore like acquire lock. Yeah. You can basically wrap that in the linker and just don't define it. And if, if anybody uses like a static function, it won't link. I've studied variables, it won't link. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's another good hack. Um, <laughs> I like good hacks. I like Stepanoff more than good hacks, but we don't have enough Stepanoff I, or whatever the plural is of Stepanoffs. <laughs> it was, okay, thanks guys. <laughs>